When people are first born, their reaction to human life is not all that positive. They cry. And then if they don't cry, it's because they're so shocked what they've just been through. I mean, at first we're totally lost. And then after I begin to get a sense, okay, there's people out there who can help us. Something out there is helping us. We get a better and better sense of who these people are, their parents. And as the Buddha said, our first reaction to stress and suffering is bewilderment. And as we get a sense of there being people out there, then the next reaction is, is there something, is there somebody out there who knows a way to get rid of this pain, this stress, this suffering? And that's usually the quest of our life. And that search outside can be useful and it can be harmful. We end up depending on the wrong people or the wrong ideas. That creates more suffering. Or we're lucky and we happen on someone who knows something about how really to put an end to suffering. And that's right in here that the Buddha offered his teachings. It's kind of expert knowledge on how to deal with suffering, how to deal with pain. And to the extent to which we listen to his teachings and put them into practice. Our search outside is actually beneficial. As the Buddha said, without him as our admirable friend, we'd be lost. But this admirable friend keeps pointing right back at us. You can't depend on the admirable friend forever. And given that the real cause of the suffering is not something external, you can't keep looking for the cure outside. You've got to learn how to look inside and develop the qualities you need so you can depend on yourself. This is where the real work is. If we depend on things outside being a certain way, they're not going to be certain. They keep changing. We want people's respect. We want people's love. We want our work to go a certain way. We want family life to go a certain way. And there's no guarantee that those things will come our way, or if they do come our way, that they'll stay. In fact, it's the nature of things that they change. This is why we have to look inside. As the Buddha once said, this is the sign of a wise person to realize that true happiness comes from training your mind. It doesn't come from arranging things to be a particular way. It comes from learning the mindfulness, the alertness, the concentration, and particularly the discernment that allows you to see what is it you're doing that's causing the suffering, because it's your lack of skill. That's creating the main danger. But fortunately, the mind can be trained. So you don't constantly have to defend yourself against your mind. You've got your other good qualities in the mind as well. You just got to learn how to use them properly, use them with confidence, use them with skill. This takes time. Sometimes it's frustrating. You work at the meditation and get into a nice peaceful state, and then it just dissolves. That happens enough times you begin to wonder, will, will it ever come to a point where it really is solid? Well, the Buddha says it does. He says that to give you hope. And it's amazing how many people find that oppressive. The idea that there's something out there that they haven't reached yet, and they would rather bring the Buddha's teachings down to their level rather than lift themselves up to his, as if somehow that were more satisfying. It's satisfying to your pride, but it's certainly not going to solve the problem of suffering. It 
because the Buddha wants you to have high standards too. He said, this is how you gain true happiness, is by holding yourself to high standards. It's like that old Calvin and Hobbes cartoon where Calvin is complaining the reason that he's unhappy is that because he has too high standards for himself. So he's decided to lower his standards so he can be happy. And he's making a snowman while he's saying this, and he ends with sort of the bottom part of the snowman and the middle part of the snowman. He says, I think this is enough right here. Hobbes remark, of course, is, remind me to invest overseas. You don't get happy by lowering your standards. You maintain high standards, and then you learn how to live with high standards. Now, not to get neurotic or upset or depressed by having high standards as you haven't reached yet. Learning how to keep at it, keep at it. Learning how to nourish yourself, learning how to energize yourself. Appreciate what steps you do make in the right direction, and learn how not to get discouraged by any backsliding. And view that as your your true nature or your true level of talent. You've got to be able to step back, develop the equanimity, develop the sense of the observer inside. They can watch the ups and downs of the practice and not get carried away by the ups and not get depressed by the downs. You realize, okay, this is a normal part of any skill. And particularly a skill like this, which requires so much sensitivity and so much such a broad sense of all the different things that can happen in the mind. We're looking after many things at once here. You're looking after your concentration, you're looking after your mindfulness, you're looking after the object of the meditation, you're looking after your mind. And until you get a sense of how to bring all those things together, one is going to slip out of your grasp, and then you go running after that, and then oh, you've left something else slip. But it's normal. As a John Mund once said, it's normal that you make mistakes before you do things right. And so right here, this ability to keep your head level as you're practicing. That's the beginning of where you begin to depend on yourself, that you found something inside that you can hold on to when everything else is going up and down. So the voices in the mind that say, well, I want this to be that way, and I want this to be this way, and still there's, and the world isn't straightened out yet, or well, the rest of my life isn't straightened out yet. I want things to be this way or that way, because you hope to depend on those things. That's the problem. You can depend on things only to a certain extent, only for a certain amount of time. And so as far as pleasures outside, happiness outside, satisfaction, fulfillment outside, you can't really place all your hopes in it. You learn how to lean on these things a little bit as you need them. But you can't make them your true home. You want your true home to be inside. Now, the world is without shelter. It offers no protection, that's what the Buddha said. But you can build a shelter inside. You can build your own protection inside. So when things outside change, you've got something solid inside. What this means is when things outside do get beyond your control, you do have to learn how to let go of them. The more you try to hold on to it, the more miserable you're going to be. But you're not totally without shelter. You've got this shelter inside. The state of the mind is your important treasure. The Buddha talks about seven treasures, and they're all qualities of the mind. He said, these are your true treasures. You've got conviction in the Buddha's awakening that it, he did it, and he did it in such a way that you can do it too.
It's virtue, a sense of shame. You'd be ashamed to stoop to do unskillful things. And a sense of compunction, realizing that you'd be afraid to do something unskillful because you know there's going to be bad consequences down the line, both for yourself and for others. You develop generosity as a form of practice and letting go. Letting go skillfully as well. In other words, you have something that's of value, and you see that other people could use it well, so you give it to them. You don't just go out and scatter things everywhere. You're trying to be judicious and figure out what and where would be the best place to give this thing. Then you don't give things away in a way that harms yourself. That's the beginning practice in discernment, which is the ultimate treasure. But the other one in the list is having knowledge of the Buddha's teachings, reading, listening. Learning how to arm yourself with good values. So even though you may not have that home inside yet, or that really solid place inside, you don't give in to the values of the world, which keeps saying, well, it's your position outside that's important. It's your success in the world that's important. It's the money that's important. It's the relationships that are important. You can't believe those values. Because they just crush people. So it's good to keep the Buddha's values in mind. It's like keeping your radio station, you're keeping your radio tuned to a good station. So instead of the station of the world, you're trying to think of the Buddha station. What is he broadcasting? Train the mind, train the mind. That's where happiness lies. That kind of teaching gives guidance to your discernment, so you know where to look, you know how to look. How to develop all the good qualities you need, how to recognize good qualities, and how to recognize the thoughts that go through the mind that are really your enemies. Learning how not to identify with them, learning to identify more with the, the tools you need. To keep the mind protected, to give you a sense of refuge, give you a sense of security, safety inside. These are your treasures. And your good name outside. That's one of what the Buddha calls conditions of the world. There's gain and there's loss. Status, loss of status. Praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. You live in the world, you've got to live with these things. And they're not really your things. You gain money. Is your name on the money? Even if you have a credit card with your name on it, it's the bank. That, the bank's name is really important there, and they're the one who controls all the terms. Your status, and again, that's something other people give you. They can take it away. They can say good things about you, and they've got the mouths and then the ability to use their mouths to say horrible things if they want to. And there's pleasure and pain, none of which are constant, none of which are dependable. You try to use these things in a skillful way. As John Lee says, regard them simply as decorations along the way. And if you gain wealth, if you gain status, learn how to use it properly. You gain a responsibility, so learn how to use them properly so it actually contributes to the growth of your mind. But you can't take them as yours. The qualities of the mind, those are your treasures. So let's keep this distinction in mind. The treasures the Buddha points to, they can't be burned by fire, they can't be washed away by floods. 
civilization, civilization may rise or fall, but the qualities of mind are still yours. So focus on your inner wealth, because that's what provides you with real security. <laughs>